Hello and welcome to the Franz Weinkath interview. I'm Lilo Jacinto and joining us in our studios here is Mr. Eugene Rogan, a professor of Middle Eastern history at Oxford University and a fellow of St. Anthony's College. Mr. Rogan's latest book, The Arabs, A History, is a sweeping, very gripping account of 500 years of history in the Arab world using an extensive range of Arabic sources. Mr. Rogan, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. It's great to be with you, Lila. Thank you for the invitation. Well, a personal question first, if I may. Uh, you are an American, but you did grow up in the Middle East and you are teaching in a British university. Mm -hmm. What made you take on such an ambitious project documenting five centuries in a very complex, complicated region? In a sense, it's been 40 years of my personal engagement with the region that was the prime driver behind this book. But I think it was also a political moment. It was a moment in the aftermath of the attacks of 9-11 in which you could see the West and the Middle East on a collision course. And I felt that as someone who professionally had been privileged by the opportunity to really get to live in, work in the region up close, I had a kind of duty to try and contribute to the public discussion about the Arab and Islamic world and to try and put a different point of view forward. And those were the converging motives behind the writing of this book. Right, but that was the start of a decade that ended in 2011. But, you know, going back even further, as you do, um, your book, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in many ways it represents a, a sort of a look at how outsiders have determined the destiny of this region, you know, from the Ottomans to the colonial powers, Cold War players. Uh, now, with the 2011 uprisings and the, the Arab Spring, as, as we call it, has that fundamentally changed? Is the region, are Arabs now finally determining their own destiny? It is the question at the moment. And I think from the perspective of 2011, it looked to me very much as though the region had reached one of those critical turning points in history that we would henceforth talk about uh, before and after 2011. And I think that is the case. I feel that for the Arab world, on the one hand, it was extremely flattering to see the Occupy Wall Street movement or movements in Africa, Asia, Europe, take the same tactics as the Arab Spring to try and bring change or criticism against their own governments. It was as though the Arabs had once again returned to the world as players and that people elsewhere in the world were imitating their methods to try and bring accountable government. So that's quite a change in modern Arab history and I think it's something which has returned a sense of dignity and purpose to people in the Arab world. But of course they continue to face very, very serious challenges. Sure, and, and you know we're gonna talk about that, but you know, so much of the discourse, especially after 9-11, was about the, you know, the golden age of Islam has been, f is, is over, you know, Islam is in its dark ages. Do you really see, I mean, can we be seeing a sort of a golden age of the Arab world? I would try and caution against language of golden ages. I think we're dealing already with a time of very heightened expectations and growing disappointment. And that makes our times since 2011 extremely volatile. Nowhere is this more obvious than in Syria, where I think people rose up in the hopes that they would be able to effect a transition like the people of Egypt and Tunisia had managed mm -hmm. to achieve, mm -hmm. or even the people of Libya. Instead, we saw that they faced a much longer, harder struggle and paid such a terrible price. And yet, I, I do think that this is a new moment of enthusiasm, where people in the Arab world believe that they have left this moment of being ruled by crude dictators behind. Mm -hmm. And even though they haven't found the great leaders that they had hoped for, they definitely feel as though they've taken an important turning. Let's talk about the leaders that they have right now, two years after the start of the uprising. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, Egypt and Tunisia. We'll go to Syria later. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, mm -hmm. uh, part of the government right now, and you as a historian, I'm just interested in what is your sense of what accounts for the longevity of this organization and how prepared is it, looking back in history, to face its new challenges? I think in the Muslim Brotherhood you see a party that on the one hand really reflects value politics. And we're not so unfamiliar with value politics in Western democracy. I mean, one can credit Bill Clinton's appeal as a Democrat mm -hmm. to working class Americans as an appeal to religion and value politics. And the Muslim Brotherhood has always had the courage of its convictions. They have stood out as having opposed dictatorial regimes and often paid a very high price for it. And lastly, I think they're extremely well organized. Despite the years of repression, they have continued to work at the grassroots level, to mobilize, to act 
perhaps as a charitable organization rather than a political party, but in a very political capacity. So when the moment came where the autocracy fell and there was a kind of vacuum created in the political arena, they were in that sense best placed to take the opportunity. And we've seen it in Tunisia, mm -hmm. we've seen it in Egypt, and I suspect we're going to see it in other parts of the Arab world where a change of government follows. Right. Talking about other parts, Syria, as you mentioned, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood has a, has a history, decades of opposition, mm -hmm. cruelly put down at times uh, to the Assad uh, mm -hmm. regime. But Syria is also, and it's, it's an ongoing, uh, it's a war right now, but Syria is also the last country which has a ruling Ba'ath uh, mm -hmm. party. Mm -hmm. What are the implications of this? One, what is the strength of the Muslim Brotherhood as far as you know in Syria? And what is the implication of the end of the Ba'ath party, you think? It's very difficult for us to weigh the power of any of the different parties at work in Syria today. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, I find Western governments have been trying to handpick those parts of the Syrian opposition that they are happy and comfortable to talk to. But we have no sense from the outside whether in fact America, France, Britain are really dealing with people who will prove influential after the fall of the Assad regime. One need only think about uh, the Iraqi National Congress, which had been a kind of exile political grouping who many in After the West... After the 2003... Well, before 2003, they had been right. an opposition group in the West who had sought the support of the United States and Great Britain, and many had placed uh, hopes on the Iraqi National Congress being the dominant force in setting the new politics. In Iraq, mm -hmm. of course, they were all seen as exiles out of touch with Iraq, and the political spectrum was dominated by internal actors. It could very well be the same situation in Syria in the aftermath of the fall of this regime. The Muslim Brotherhood is clearly a player in Syria. As in the case of Egypt, they have deep historical roots, they have grassroots activism, but they also have a kind of uh, confidence crisis to overcome among Syrians at large because they had been portrayed for so long within Syria mm -hmm. as a terrorist organization and an organization with blood on its hands. But the groups that have come together as a coalition to oppose the Ba'ath regime seem almost certain to overturn that regime, and in the near future. I, I think we're looking at a regime which is really in its final, final months of struggle. The end of Ba'ath rule in Syria is going to create a power vacuum at the very heart of the Middle East mm -hmm. that has to have each of its neighbors on high alert. Turkey, Iraq, Lebanon, Israel are all countries that are going to feel this change of, uh, of power as something which is going to enter in an age of great uncertainties. Right. I mean, you mentioned the regional players, but I, I also want to talk about, and we're running out of time, um, the West, mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. Uh, and the European countries. And, and it's interesting that you talked about uh, Iraq and what happened uh, after the U.S. invasion. For all practical purposes, two years after the 2011, uh, the start of the uprising, this is turning into a Sunni resurgence mm -hmm. against the Shiites and by proxy, Iran. Um, is the West that has been largely supportive and trying to find partners, is, mm. is, is the West aware of what is happening in relation to the Sunni-Shiite dynamic and where are we heading here? The West seems to be quite preoccupied by tensions between Sunni and Shia Muslims. I think they overstate the case. On the one hand, I do not believe that Iran is a particularly attractive role model. I believe the people in the Arab world have always been suspicious of, of Iran and seen it as a country alien to their own culture. I think what's really changed and what shifted the balance was the overthrow of the Ba'athist government in Iraq, Saddam Hussein, in mm -hmm. 2003, which allowed the majority Shiite population of Iraq to come to power. And I think because you have a Shiite-led regime in Iraq, which has very good relations with Iran, that this has led to a shift in the balance of power in the region that has raised real concerns. So Iran, if Shiites in the Arab world do not look to Iran as, as a source of inspiration or the Iranian revolution? Many do, and certainly if one looks at the Shiites of South Lebanon, we see again a very close relationship between Hezbollah and the regime in Iran. But it's not the case that where you find Shiites, you find partisans of Iran. And certainly it's been a mistake to view Shiites in Bahrain, for example, as the cat's paw of Iran reaching into the heart of the Gulf. And I feel the same way about the Shiite population of the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. And I think it's a huge mistake for those countries to discriminate against their Arab citizens of Shiite faith because they see them as somehow proxies of Iran. This is creating a conflict between Shiites and Sunnis, 
which has real, really no need to it. There is no necessity for that. And where could this go, this conflict in the Gulf mon monarchies? I feel as though the Gulf monarchies are going to resist change by all means at their disposal. The real game changer will be as the Iranian nuclear research program works towards a, a possible you know, arms or military capacity. If they develop a nuclear weapon, I think that the tension between Sunni and Shia in the region will be driven to a level of uh, nuclear arms race that will be quite destabilizing to the region. Wow. Uh, quickly then, well, since we've come to the, you know, nuclear I Iran, you more than anyone as a historian, uh, you know, understand that sometimes history can go horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. Are there any radars that we have right now that we can look into the future to, to be on the watch out for? I think the world's on guard already about the situation in Iran. I think there's real concern about the future of Israel and Palestine. And I think everyone's quite concerned to see what follows the fall of the Assad regime in Syria. So I think everyone's looking at the right places. Mm -hmm. We have issues that are very, very serious rocking the region today. The historian in me tells me we've got very important stories developing and that far from the end of history, the Arabs are going on towards a very tumultuous and challenging history ahead. And I hope we're also moving towards another book from you. I look forward to being back to talk about another book soon. Thank you so much for being with yeah, us. It's a pleasure. And that's it for this edition of the Franz Van Kett interview. But do stay with us on Franz Van Kett.